you want to learn the unique deck-building game that is Keyforge. Well, sir and or madam, you have made the first of two great decisions. The second was clicking this video. In this instructional tape, you will learn all the tools you need to conquer the vaults of the Crucible and claim the precious ember within, becoming a true master of Keyforge. This is young Tommy. He's an idiot. Young Tommy does not know how to play Keyforge. Of course I do. Shut up, Tommy. Seriously. Follow along with young Tommy here as he learns alongside you with these six easy-to-learn parts. Part 1. What is Keyforge and why would I care? Part 2. The phases of the game. Part 3. The types of cards you'll see in play. Part 4. Special effects and other game mechanics. Part 5. Tips to get good. Part 6. A few example turns in order to show you how the flow of the game works. Well, if anything, you should be teaching me how to play. No, Jason. Get out of my video. Bye. <coughs> uh, I'm not doing that voice the whole time. Ugh, um, anyway, where was I? <laughs> All right. Part one. What is Keyforge and why would I care? Keyforge is a unique deck building game created by the creator of Magic the Gathering. Overall, the game plays very much like Magic. However, there are a few key differences, no pun intended, majority of which actually base around the way the game is actually constructed and not played. Instead of a trading card game, Keyforge is a unique deck card game. Instead of buying booster packs and constructing your deck from a card pool that you yourself own, you are instead buying a booster pack which contains one fully constructed deck with one unique, procedurally generated Archon. This Archon is unique to your deck, no one else has your Archon, as well as no one else has the deck list in which your Archon has. There is no deck building, your deck list cannot be changed, and any further cards that you purchase or own cannot be placed into your deck in order to make what would be considered a full power strategy, much like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering, or other such card games. The procedurally generated deck list that your deck has has been tailor-made to have a specific strategy that only your deck can do with its own specific card list, and it's up to you as the player to tease out all the broken plays and combos that you can think of with the cards at your disposal. Conventional wisdom to somebody who hasn't played the card game might in fact think that this is a great way to have an unbalanced deck. There is not much to say that your randomly generated deck would be any better or different than your opponent's randomly generated deck. And by that same logic, there is a chance that your opponent's randomly generated deck will be way too broken because of the weird card list it just happened to be given. However, it seems that the algorithm used to create these decks does in fact try to make all the decks on an even playing field. Everyone's strategy is unique, your deck might be weak against a certain strategy, but it is not generally weak compared to every other deck's power level. And if there is some weird unforeseen consequence of your deck's card combinations, there are rules in place for certain formats that can actually nerf a deck that is considered objectively better than its opponents which is something we will we'll talk about later. The biggest advantage of having the game constructed this way means the cost of entry for any player is extremely low. A deck costs about $10 MSRP, and if you really wanted to, you could pretty much only ever spend that $10 and always be competitive as long as the current trends continue and that every deck ends up being on the same power level. The only time you'd ever really want to spend more than $10 on the games if you want to have a bunch of different decks so that you have various play styles so that you can get kind of a feel of every card in the game, and if there's any cards that come out in new sets that you want to get your hands on. And any cards that are way too powerful to have more than one copy of, something like a library access here, is automatically limited by the computer constructing your deck via the algorithm, so you never have to worry about one of your decks becoming illegal. So upkeep is also very easy in this game. The uniqueness of the game, however, is not completely centered around the way the game is constructed, but through some of its gameplay elements as well. The major win condition, and pretty much only win condition, of Keyforge is to forge three keys. Go figure. You forge keys at the start of your turn when you have six ember, ember being a resource that you accrue through gameplay. And that's pretty much it. There are no life points. When your creatures fight each other, there is no damage dealt to the other player. And the only way to win is to forge these three keys. Because of that, duels between two archons, which is what your person is considered to be, end up being more of a race than a battle leading to a less directly competitive game and more of a who can build the best strategy while undermining their opponents. So at its core, the game plays a little bit different than anything else, being an interesting change of pace. Listen to him, <laughs> <laughs> what are the goddamn faces? <laughs>
Okay, so you've either watched the previous video where I talked about this, or you're watching this first part, and you have now decided that you want to learn how to play the game, which is, will be the, uh, that's, this will be the bulk of this video. In my experience in tooling around with the game, I figured out that probably going through an example turn is probably the best way to learn the game. And like any good card game, your turn has phases. I won't go into too much detail for the quote main phase part of the thing, that'll obviously be more covered in the types of cards you'll see, because that's when you'd play all of them. However, I should, I'll, I'll, I'll at least mention it. A game of Key Forge starts with each player drawing six cards from their deck. After randomly deciding which player goes first, the turn one player actually gets to start with an extra card, that's seventh. But during their main phase of the game, they're actually only allowed to play one card as a way of balancing going first. But other than that, a turn will proceed as follows. The first phase of the game is the Forge a Key phase. Obviously, as this title uh, implies, this is when you would spend any of that amber I mentioned earlier, six if there is no uh, stagnant game mechanics or effects lingering, to forge one of your three keys. Once you, uh, w once you get to that third key, you win the game. You must forge a key during your Forge a Key phase. You cannot skip your Forge a Key phase unless, of course, a card has told you to, and if you have the required current amount of ember in your ember pool, as it were, then you must forge the key. The next phase of the game is called the choose a house phase. Any standard key forge deck has three houses. Your deck is 36 cards, and you will find that there are 12 cards of each house. Houses being a lot like attributes in Yu-Gi-Oh! or the colors in, in uh, Magic. During your declare a house phase, you must declare a house that is on your Archon card. Unless, of course, you happen to control a card that is outside of one of your standard three houses, and in this case, you may declare that house instead. That's a very rare instance, however. When you declare one of these houses, that means for the rest of the turn, you may only ever play or use cards of that house. In a 36-card deck where one-third of your deck is each house, that means that, on average, only one-third of your hand, unless you've been tailoring your hand at the end of your turn, is playable at any given time. Most cards don't have any sort of cost, so the way the game balances itself is that you can only play one-third of your deck at any given time. After you have declared your active house for the rest of the turn, if you have any, quote, archived cards, which is something we'll go over later, you may either add none of these or all of these to your hand. In Keyforge, your archive is face down and only knowledge to the controller of the archive, so your opponent does not get to know what cards are archived to you. Early in the game, neither player will probably have archived cards, as it's not something that you can do particularly voluntarily. The third phase of the game is your play, use, or discard phase, or your, your main phase. As long as a card is in your chosen house, you may use or play that card. Playing means to use a card from your hand and place it on the field. Use traditionally means a card that is already on the field and you're choosing to do one of its appropriate actions. You may also discard cards from your hand of the active house for no effect. In other words, you may voluntarily empty cards out of your hand to the graveyard. That kind of extreme loss of card advantage might sound a little weird, but we will go over in the later parts of why you would, you would ever want to do that. Remember, there is no, quote, battle phase in this game. You may fight with creatures or play your action cards or whatever in any order you want, as long as you're only using each card once per turn. Unless, of course, you have another copy or you have another card that's allowing you to use a card more than once. If you do have some sort of combo that allows you to continuously use cards, you may only use a card up to six times per turn. This rule of six prevents you from doing ridiculous loops. Something like auto cannon and bad penny with some other effect. Once you've used all the cards or discarded all the cards that you wish to use of the current declared house, you may now proceed to the fourth step of the game, and that is the ready cards. I'll explain exhausted and ready in the next section, but if any cards have been exhausted, this is where they are placed back in the ready position. The final step of the game is the draw phase. Another strange thing about Keyforge is you draw cards at the end of your turn instead of the start. And unlike other card games, during your draw phase, you refill your hand to six cards. So if you have five cards in hand, you draw one. If you have no cards in hand, you draw six. Obviously, there are cards and effects that allow you to draw more during your draw cards phase. However, if there is none of these effects in play, your hand is refilled to six. Also, if you have enough amber in your ember pool so that you will forge a key on your next turn, you must also declare, quote, check, signaling to your opponent that if during their next turn after your turn completes, 
they don't deal with the current count of ember in your ember pool, you'll be forging a key. Kind of like in chess, when you declare check because the king is about to be taken, next move, unless, of course, the other player does something about it. From what I can tell, this is simply a courtesy so that you don't kind of hide how much ember you have so your opponent makes a play they would not have otherwise done, simply because they were not aware that you were about to win the game next turn. One final note for your draw phase is that if you go to draw cards for any reason, whether it is via a card effect or during the draw phase, and you find that you have decked yourself out, simply take your discard pile, shuffle it up, let your opponent cut it, and then start drawing from that as if it was your deck from the start. Long story short, there is no deck out lose condition in this game. What kind of cards are there in Keyforge? Okay, so now you know how a turn proceeds with the cards that you have, however, what are the cards you have and how do you use them? During your main phase of the game, you may play, use, or discard any cards of the current house, unless of course a card effect is telling you otherwise. Before we proceed, I must stress this more than any other point. If you get anything out of this video, it's this point. Cards that are activated resolve as far as they can go. Whether or not that means they fizzle for no effect, or you can only activate part of their effect, and the rest does nothing, it does not matter. Cards must resolve, and will resolve as far as they go. If there is something preventing you from fulfilling the full effect of a card, it does not stop you from actually using the card, unlike some other card games. Meaning that there are instances where you will play a card to the field and it will do literally nothing. But anyway, let's continue. The first main bulk of your deck will most likely be your creature cards. Creatures are your monsters, they are your army, they are what you use to do a majority of the legwork in your deck. When you play a creature to the field, it enters play exhausted, set sideways like this. The basic layout of your field is the front row, which is your battle line, which is where your creatures go, and the second line is where the, all the other stuff goes. The first creature enters your battle line right in the middle. Any subsequent creatures that you play are played on a flank of current creatures on the board. Creatures in battle lines that are directly next to each other are considered, quote, neighbors, and the creatures that are on either end of your battle line are considered your battle line's flanks. The reason why this is important is because there are certain card effects that deal with neighbors and flanks, so it is important to know that where you are placing your creatures on your battle line may or may not actually matter. You must play a creature on a flank of your battle line. You cannot wedge a creature into your battle line somewhere in the middle unless there's a card effect that's allowing you to do so. Only cards that are ready can be used during a turn. Basically meaning that most monsters come to the field with some sort of quote summoning sickness. Creatures have a battle power and an armor rating. Many creatures do not have armor. If a creature does not have armor, in its armor slot here, it'll show a tilde instead of a number. When a creature is dealt damage in any way, if it has armor, once during the current turn, you can reduce the amount of damage taken to that creature by its armor rating. At the end of your turn, your creature gets its armor back. Damage can be dealt through battle or through card effect. A creature's power rating describes how much health it has as well as how much damage it deals when it's fighting. If a creature has had its power rating increased, it does more damage while it fights, and it can soak up more damage before it dies. Damage on a creature, however, does not reduce its power output. If a creature has 5 power and it has 4 damage on it, simply that means it can only take one more damage before it dies, but if it's doing any fighting or whatever, it is still doing 5 damage to everything else. So you have a ready creature on the board, what can you do with it? You have one of three actions. You may fight with the creature, reap with the creature, or use some sort of ignition ability. Whenever you choose one of these three actions, you take the ready creature and you exhaust it. Unless you have any means of getting that creature ready again, that is your one use of that card this turn. When a creature fights, you exhaust it, pick a target, and then each creature does damage to each other equal to its power rating. Unless, of course, there's some sort of special effect or armor or something else involved. The next thing you can do with a creature is reap. Reap is going to be probably your main source of ember generation because when you exhaust a creature for a reap action, you gain one ember to your ember pool. Some creatures have abilities that activate when they reap, meaning something else will happen when this happens. However, any creature can reap unless there's something telling you you can't. If a creature does not have a reap ability, when you reap it, you simply get the ember from it and then that's it. The last thing is a generic action. Some creatures do not have effects that activate when other things happen, although most of them do. Some just have a bare action on them and you can use their once per turn use to do this action instead of fight or reap. Think something like Pit Demon. 
if a creature is stunned, something I'll go over later, the only thing that creature can do this turn is unstun itself. So it's blowing its one action to exhaust itself on getting rid of the stun. The next type of card are Action cards. Action cards are a lot like spell cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! You simply play them to the field, they tend to have play abilities, meaning when they hit the field they do something, and you resolve the effect on the card as it is. Once an action card is resolved, it goes to the card graveyard. The third type of card are your artifacts. Artifacts enter play exhausted a lot like a creature, so they have some sort of summoning sickness. If you have a ready artifact and it has an action ability, you can exhaust the artifact in order to activate its ability. Some artifacts just have continuous ambient effects that don't require you to actually exhaust the artifact to use it, and others have an Omni ability, which allows you to use their effect even if the current house is not the house that's printed on the card. Please note, if your artifact has an Omni ability to put it onto the field, it needs to be your active house, but at a later time, in another turn, once it's ready, you can use its Omni ability, regardless of house that is declared. The last type of card in this game currently is an upgrade card. Upgrade cards, when played to the field, target a creature on the board, and then are placed under that creature to signify which creature it's equipped to. If you want to know what the upgrade card does, it will most likely explain to you what its power is and what it's bestowing to the creature that it's equipped to. If the creature leaves the field in any way, the equip cards just go to the grave. Another thing of note, you may notice that certain cards have an ember symbol up on the top left. This means they have a quote, ember bonus. When the card is played to the field, and only when it's played, not when it's used, you put one bonus ember into your ember pool. This happens before the card's effect resolves, so if the card has something to do with ember generation or ember stealing or something like that, you gotta make sure that your ember pool is up to date via the ember bonus before you resolve any of these effects. If a card has a play ability that will not actually do anything because it will fail to resolve, but the card does have an ember bonus, you are completely allowed to play that card to the field for the ember bonus, have it resolve of no effect, and go to the graveyard. So so you don't ever need to discard a card from your hand of the current house if it has an ember bonus, you can just play it instead. What are some of the special effects of these cards and shit? Alright, so now we know what kinds of cards are in the game as well as how a turn proceeds. But uh, as with any card game, when you have cards, you're gonna have some text. So at this section, we're gonna go over a couple of game terms and other things that you might need to know just going into a game so you don't have to look everything up a million times as you're trying to start to learn to play. But obviously I can't go over every single game mechanic and effect that's relevant or useful because otherwise this video would be 48 hours long. A great place to start is something that I mentioned earlier and that will be a stun. If a creature is stunned by a card effect, which is predominantly the only way to stun a creature, you must place a stun counter on that card. The starter set of this game comes with some extra card stock that has the word stun on it that you can use, but you can pretty much use anything as long as both players have got some consensus as that means to be stunned. The player who controls the stunned creature during a turn in which they have called the active house of that creature can use an action to unstun the creature. That creature cannot fight, that creature cannot reap, that creature cannot use any other actions that it may have until it is exhausted to get rid of the stun. In order to use that creature again this turn, you will have to find another means to ready it again and then use its abilities again. But if a creature is stunned, that is predominantly the only thing it can do that turn, hence the word stun. Another ability that you will see on creature cards, especially in the house shadows, is an ability called elusive. First time a creature with the elusive keyword is attacked each turn, it is dealt no damage and deals no damage to the attacker in its fight. This only applies to combat damage and not to any effect damage dealt by some other card effect. In layman's terms, the first fight that this creature does during a turn in which it's attacked, pretty much nothing happens. It blows your opponent's attack action. Conversely, the ability Skirmish is when a creature with the Skirmish keyword is used to fight, it takes no damage from the opposing creature when damage is dealt. If some sort of card effect tells you to steal an ember from your opponent, you take that ember from their ember pool and place it in your ember pool. It's now yours. When a creature captures an ember from an opponent, you take that ember from their ember pool and place it on the creature capturing it as opposed to in your ember pool. Neither player can spend ember that's captured on a creature. However, basically the reason why you'd want to do this is to remove that ember from both ember pools so that neither player can use it. If that creature is to leave the field, it goes to the opponent's ember pool. 
So if I capture one of your embers with my Dexter and you kill my Dexter, your the ember on Dexter goes back to your pool. Some cards will bestow chains to your deck if you were to use their ability, something like Gateway to Dis. Chains are not like chains in Yu-Gi-Oh, but instead chains like something that'd be on your feet, like a fetter, or the old ball and chain, as it were. Here is the Chain Tracker. This lets you keep track of the current number of chains. If you have accrued chains one through six, during your draw cards phase, you draw one card fewer. When you enter your draw cards phase, you shed one chain. So if you have three chains, that means for the next three draw phases, you draw one less card. This is the game's way of auto-balancing crazy effects that are super blowouts by making you take less card advantage during your draw phase. Sacrifice is another interesting thing. If you're a veteran Yu-Gi-Oh player, you'll know that a card is sacrificed by sending itself to the graveyard in order to pay some sort of cost. In Key Forge, that's exactly the same. However, it should be noted that any card that is sacrificed is considered destroyed. Which lets us go into the next part. Certain cards may have Fight, Reap, Destroyed, or some other contextual ability. When that context is fulfilled, for instance, when Bad Penny is destroyed, her effect activates. In this case, she returns to the hand instead of going to the graveyard. This is why certain cards like Pit Demon are one of the few creatures that can use that third choice during a turn because its action is simply a bare action and must be activated by exhausting and does not activate when something else happens. You will find that most creatures actually have their unique ability tied to one of the other two actions, either Fight or Reap. Whereas when they do one or the other, as long as by doing that action they did not leave the field, this is especially important when it comes to fight abilities, you then may be able to do their action. So yes, a fight ability will not resolve if the creature is killed when it was trying to fight. When a creature is attacked, it does not get its fight ability, only when it is doing the fighting, presumably on your turn. A creature with taunt protects its neighbors from being attack targets, and only the creature with taunt can be attacked. And of course, unless one of its neighbors in the battle line also has taunt. The last two turns that we should probably talk about are Archive and Purge. Some cards will allow you to archive a card. At the start of your turn after you declare a house, you may take any and all cards in your archive that are face down that are only knowledge to you and add them to your hand. You cannot archive cards unless by card effect. And again, if you choose to add your archive to your hand, you must do the entire thing. Archive and Purge are both removed from play, but Purge is more removed from play than Archive. If a card is purged, instead of being placed in the Archive zone, it is instead placed under the owner's Archon card to be completely removed from the game entirely. With the exception of the card Spangler Box, which is just the weirdest card in the game, frankly. Also one of my favorites. And those are probably all the effects that you're going to see on a regular basis that you kind of would like to have an inherent knowledge of how they work so you don't have to constantly be looking up rulings. <laughs> what are some tips to, to get it good? But uh, all these parts, a sum of greater than, they do not make. What? It really takes a good player of the game to actually win a game of Keyforge, not simply a player who knows how the game works. So what are some tips you can do or use in order to actually get good at the game? Now, I will never, ever, ever say that I'm a pro player, but there are some things that I've learned in my tooling around that I've seen to yield better results than others. Holding cards is a bad idea. Just because you're playing a deck with shadows and you happen to have the card bait and switch in your hand doesn't mean you should save that bait and switch for five turns later when it's actually good. Yes, the card is absolutely broken and it'd be a total shame to discard it during a shadows turn. However, I have found that holding cards isn't very good. During your draw phase, it is best to refill your hand to six by drawing as much as possible, cycling through your deck as much as possible to get to the cards that are actually helpful now. When you run out of cards in your small 36 card deck, you just take your discard pile and make it your new deck so you can get back to the cards that you discarded earlier so that you can use them at a later date. This is especially useful for cards that tend to have late game abilities that aren't very good in the first couple of turns. Getting them out of their hand is better than just sitting on them. In this same vein, if your deck has the ability to archive cards, something like maybe Mobius Scroll, this is a great way to get power cards like that bait and switch out of your hand without actually having to worry about discarding it. 
By archiving a power card like this, which let's say maybe it's the only shadows card in your hand, so making a shadows turn even though you have the one-off blowout card would not yield you very much results, you can archive that card, save it for later, and then when during one of your draw turn phases things, when you draw a bunch of shadows cards on your next turn, you can declare shadows and then add your bait and switch in your archive back to your hand, so now you can make a wombo combo bigger shadows turn. You will find that archiving is in most cases much better than discarding cards that you want to get out of your hand simply because you can then add them to your hand at a later time so you can start a turn with an extra couple of cards, which, you know, is awesome. Learning when and how to archive cards will be one of the biggest make or break things when it comes to competitive Keyforge. Be mindful of your sprint. Sprint's a, a kind of a fan term that I've seen thrown around a couple of times, but it's actually pretty apt when you consider the fact that this game is more of a race than a duel. You will constantly find yourself weighing your options between calling a house that contains all the cards that are in your hand, or calling a house that is the majority of cards you have on the field. Playing new creatures and artifacts to the field lets your board presence go up, but it doesn't actually let you gain any ember in most cases, or affect the game state very much. Playing or using cards that are already on the field allow you to reap for more ember or start doing some battle to take cards off your opponent's field. However, it doesn't let you draw anything during your draw phase because you didn't use any cards in your hand. Sprinting is when you make a giant ember push to make yourself in check so that on your next turn you can forge a key. Constantly keeping track of how many embers you would need to sprint to get to your six or whatever the current cost of a key is, there are certain cards that increase or decrease your key cost or your opponent's key cost, can help you decide what house you need to call this turn. If you have four or five monsters on board and your opponent doesn't have any effects to seemingly stop you, calling that house might be the most important thing to do because you can reap for almost an entire key and also use any reap abilities your monsters might have. Pushing for that key in one move would be your sprint. Knowing what house to call at any given time when nothing else seems right. If you can't figure out what the best house to call this turn is because nothing seems very good, maybe you don't have a super huge board presence so calling that house isn't going to be very good, and maybe your hand is full of a bunch of different stuff so calling any of those houses isn't going to be great either, what do you do? I've found that simply calling the house that has the most cards of the same house in your hand is normally your best worst option. If your hand is like three shadows, two sanctum, and one brobnar, Calling that Brobnar isn't really going to do you very much good because you're only going to be able to use one card and, and then only draw one card during your draw phase. Using those three Shadows cards, however, will lead you a huger draw, which means you can then try to get cards for the other two houses that you don't have as many cards for, so that the turns after you can make bigger plays with those houses instead. And last but not least, keeping a generic, vague idea of the card pool can do you some good. Knowing what the power cards in each house can change how you play a game. If your opponent has shadows, you're going to know that they're going to steal a lot of your ember. And if you get too far ahead, they might drop the card bait and switch on you. And then you're going to lose that ember advantage that you have and pretty much just give it to your opponent. So making a humongous sprint and overshooting your key too much against a shadows player may not be the best option. And if your opponent is, let's say, playing... Robnar, you know that their monsters tend to be big and they may have the Khalifi Dragon, the biggest monster currently in the game, which again could be a problem if you're not ready for having that kind of a beat stick on board. Knowing the power cards in each house can let you have an early advantage of knowing what to look out for. All right, I think that's where we'll stop for today. Uh, that last part, part six, I think we'll reserve for a second video because this thing is getting super, super long and uh, as valuable as a uh, example a couple of turns would be to everybody. I don't think anyone's going to sit here and actually <laughs> wait for that to come up. So I'm going to give you this in a bit more of a digestible fashion. But anyway guys, let me know down in the comments below what you guys think of Keyforge. I'm actually really enjoying the game. It's a lot of fun and it's a great distraction when you're getting bored of other stuff because it's investments low and it's super fun to play. But anyway guys, remember if you don't troll the meta who will, I'll see you guys next time. Oh, hey losers, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. Wanna watch something else? Hurry up and choose one of these. Ugh. When are you gonna make a choice? This year would be nice.